welcome to Learning Impact on Demand 2020, Solutions for Highly Effective Digital Teaching and Learning in response to the accelerated move to remote education. At IMS Global Consortium, we believe in the power of dynamic collaboration as a catalyst for digital innovation and transformation in education. In this spirit, we're bringing together leaders in our community, representing top learning institutions and ed tech suppliers to share knowledge and ideas of reimagining the educational experience and explore new opportunities for shaping the future of teaching and learning. Today's topic is equity, agency, and mastery, innovations needed to enhance student success in a more virtual world. My name is Monica Watts, and I'm Director of K-12 Engagement at IMS Global. We are joined by an esteemed panel of speakers today, Giovanni Benincasa. Giovanni is the UX Manager at Chicago Public Schools. Welcome, Giovanni. Thanks for having me. Kara Thornton, Director of Libraries and Instructional Technology at Chicago Public Schools. Hi, Kara. Hi. Martin McGuire, Director of Educational Technologies, Digital Solutions, and UX at Chicago Public Schools. Welcome, Marty. Thank you. And lastly, Tim Beekman, President and Co-Founder of Safari Montage. Hi, Tim. Hi, Monica. Thank you for having me. Welcome. It's good to see everyone. Marty, let's begin with you. Um, you have such a rich history with this project. Uh, can you tell us the story of how this project began and the original vision? Uh, a very, very long story. It started some uh, 16 years ago. Uh, and originally what we were trying to do, uh, you gotta remember Chicago is 600 schools large. Um, so doing anything and, and, and being able to cover a district of this size is very rare. Uh, and it took years for us to get there. So um, uh, given the limited uh, uh, connectivity available at schools, I think back in the day when we first started it, uh, if I remember correctly, we were running T1 lines at schools. Um, so we we had to have multiple, so we had to have an individual server at every school to start this program off. And we were working with E-Rate back in the day. So uh, we had to wait for schools to become eligible uh, so that we can get that hardware to get that equipment into that school. Um, and even after years of, of working uh, that way, uh, you know, it, it came to the point where our network had, had made such improvements that we were able to kind of pull those local servers and just have a, a I want to say currently, I think three servers now that run the entire district where we at one time had a server in every one of our 600 schools. Um, so that was that was a, a quite a feat to try and uh, pull off. Uh, the, the idea had always been that we, we wanted to do is we wanted to converge uh, video on demand, uh, live video content and um, uh, cable television all into a single platform. And that was something that we were able to do right out of the box with Safari. Uh, but it was getting to scale to the size of CPS that was, was um, uh, always the challenge for us. And it wasn't because of the technology itself. It was because of, 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 of our technology, uh, our ability, uh, our networks, um, our buying process uh, back in the day. But now that uh, you flash forward so many years, um, we have that connectivity in every school. The challenge then became how do we get content to everybody? How do we standardize on what we're delivering via this platform? And uh, you know, thankfully, that's when we started putting together a team. After that many years, we put together a team of, uh, that included Giovanni, that included Kara, uh, to help us actually build uh, the content uh, groups, the different things that we were going to be working with uh, and providing school to school, but then bringing in these vendors and working you know, uh, harder on being able to develop content that every school would be able to have access to. And that, that's pretty much where we are today. This is a fundamental question for our dialogue. What are the elements of the Chicago Public Schools digital ecosystem? Sure, well, there, so we, we're putting a digital ecosystem together that will allow us to um, have an equitably accessible district-wide digital curriculum for grades pre-K through 12. And in order to do so, we had to put a lot of pieces of the puzzle together. Some created from existing resources that Chicago Public Schools um, already partnered with, and some that were newly contracted with in order to create the ecosystem. So our learning objects repository where all of our curricular content will be housed is um, in partnership with Safari Montage. 
And then our learning management system, we're not really using a traditional like full body learning management system where um, our district uses um, G Suite for education. So we're using Google Classroom as to support that work. And we're going to ideally see really deep integrations with Classroom and our student information system, which is Fall at Aspen, which will allow teachers to um, push grades into the gradebook within Aspen and to, um, which is a feature that Google Classroom has not been able to um, facilitate to the district before. In addition, we have an assessment suite that is aligned with our curricular content and will also be aligned with our SIS, and that is um, School City by Illuminate. And then we've got, uh, and then we also have our secure SSO portal is Rapid Identity. So amidst all of these big elements of the digital ecosystem, we also have many, many digital resources, big and small, including our library automation system and all of the digital teaching and learning tools that students and teachers use every day. Right. Giovanni, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the history of this project and why CPS pursued the curriculum equity initiative. And could you also tell us about the current state of, of teaching and learning in the district? Sure. Um, those are really uh, broad questions. And um, we probably can't get to all aspects of those, but to keep it simple and really focused on thinking about that digital ecosystem and the problem that it intends to solve, while at the same time thinking about the digital curriculum and what problem it intends to solve, you really have technology diffusion, lots of people using lots of different platforms, um, a login for each, trying to corral all the data or the outputs that come from those, and then having a real wide variety from classroom to classroom, from school to school in terms of what tools are accessed, what students have access to those tools and so forth. And the digital ecosystem is at least attempting uh, to make that a more coherent uh, learning experience with all of the positive things that you can get from having interoperable data to come from that. The, on the curriculum side of things, it's, it's a similar issue. You have wide variety from classroom to classroom, from school to school, in terms of quality of the materials. Um, we've li been living nicely in a standards oriented world for a decade, um, but are the learning materials as well matched to the standards? Well, that varies. You have a, a wide variety of teacher expertise. Um, <clears throat> you also have uh, turnover um, throughout the system. So your class assignment or where you end up becomes somewhat of a lottery ticket. And at, at that point, we wanna make sure, you know, can we provide a baseline for everyone so that all the things that we want to see happen in education, from personalization to seeing some sort of um, alignment uh, and, and guaranteed viable access to um, the, a quality curriculum is something that we can say with confidence as opposed to hope is occurring, but really have no way to have any insight into whether that's happening or not. So this initiative attempts to um, move towards making the situation better for both of those environments, the actual user experience and the learning materials themselves. So Kara, Giovanni mentioned um, turnover. Um, from your perspective, um, how is CPS supporting the Curriculum Equity Initiative with professional learning? Well, there's actually multiple phases of release of our content, and that's being supported by professional learning in different ways. So we, are, um, we will be releasing content early be, for a variety of reasons, and so that is kind of, that's being rushed out to schools. And in an effort to support that with as, as qual high quality of professional learning as we can on a very short timeline, we're creating a library of video content that is, that's being created, not just in partnership with some of our partners, including Safari Montage, Illuminate, 
and our vendor partners who are creating the curricular content itself, but also by our in-house teams. And that's going to be shared with teachers via a variety of delivery methods, both on CPS's intranet, and then also um, hopefully sent out to teachers actively via, um, you know, via newsletters. And we're hoping to offer a variety of synchronous and asynchronous uh, professional learning access for our early release. Then over the course of the next year, as we lead up to our official full release, we have a variety of phases of professional learning that's all going to be happening simultaneously. Initially, we had a plan to um, pilot the content in schools with teachers and students directly. And although there still is some energy around trying to put together a pilot, it's been very difficult for us to envision how that will look in with partial or full remote learning and how we'll be able to get meaningful data and information from that. So the pilot process is not entirely on hold, but we are trying to be creative and thoughtful about the way that we implement a pilot. We're also going to be doing um, user experience testing with a variety of different stakeholders to make sure that our curriculum system is usable, engaging, easy to access, etc. And then um, we also are going to be engaged in a ton of professional learning with a variety of partners. So our internal teams, the, the, um, we're part of the CPS Department of Curriculum Instruction and Digital Learning, and we fall under the larger umbrella of the Office of Teaching and Learning, which contains all the content teams, literacy, STEM, social science, and civic engagement. And we're going to partner with the content teams to ensure that the um, digital curricular materials are integrated into their professional learning in really meaningful ways so that when teachers are learning best practices and in instruction it's being done explicitly with the content that we're developing and then last but not least we also are going to engage in a lot of meaningful create meaningful training opportunities with all of our different partners both as part of the digital ecosystem and our curriculum partners. And we're hoping through that we can really leverage the expertise of the partners, along with the CPS specific knowledge and instructional knowledge to try to cover all of our bases and give teachers and students their best opportunity to succeed with the materials. Marty, let's talk about the learner and the student um, for a little bit. Um, how do you ensure that the curriculum will be engaging for this learner representative of your entire student population and that the curriculum will meet each student's needs? We have a variety of different content providers that we're working with. Um, we're trying to give people a, a taste of, of, of content that's just not um, video content, but uh, interactives, live content that we could bring into the classrooms. There's a number of ways that we're trying to do that, um, uh, not just through the, the platform itself, uh, but um, through the resources that we're bringing in via that platform. Giovanni, um, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the work that we're able to do now really builds on the work that Marty's team did in bringing video and bringing virtual field trip experiences to classrooms, right? Their ability to have reach into classrooms, I think, really was um, illustrative for the district to say to themselves, this is the mechanism that we would want to deliver a curriculum. You know, gone are the days of forklifts and pallets and here come the textbooks and, you know, there you have your learning for the next 10 years. Um, with what Marty's team was able to do through Safari was digitally deliver content that was immediately available to every student, every teacher in the system. So now to bring that communication in essentially on that channel um, allowed for us to really move the needle on a couple of things <clears throat> in terms of engagement. You know, that 10-year-old that textbook is kind of dated. We have the ability to keep things updated and timely, especially uh, in the sciences uh, where these updates are instantly available. If you think about the logistics of 600 plus schools and 20,000 plus uh, teachers, you know, almost a quarter of a million students, being able to say we can move with an improvement on a course uh, and, and to do that at a click is, is really a game changer for resources, logistics, and so many things. Um, you know, when we think about culturally relevant, uh, cult culturally relevant materials, 
um, you know, not to be crass, if you look at the icons here, are we really the people to be approximating cultural relevance from 35,000 feet? You know, uh, we've tried, let's let every teacher try to find their own way. And that has produced the problem of a lot of variability, some lowballing of students and so forth. But when you try to standardize, you know, then you end up with a handful of people like us making decisions for other people's children. Um, what we're doing by bringing this in a digital format, it is allows us to bring in a guaranteed viable curriculum for everyone. But the important thing is the teacher's ability to customize. See, when the teacher is able to customize with a understanding of students' local needs, take for instance, a use case in which a classroom has a wide variety of groupings of students who aren't on grade level by giving them a really robust learning object repository, now that teacher can build bridges to that curriculum, can localize and customize in ways that as well-intentioned as we are, we can't. And when you, when you empower teachers to have that ability to remix and modify, but you don't give them an empty box and say, you know, good luck with this. You, you, you give them a baseline of solid materials that are standards aligned, that are aligned to um, assessments, but then you give them customizable tools within that. Now you're really doing something different. Um, you're respecting the uh, autonomy and agency of teachers who know their craft, while at the same time not burdening them to build every single thing they need out of nothing. Um, this is the best way that we can think of to bring and leverage a large district's um, buying power and ability to do things at scale while also leveraging the teacher's local understanding of their school and their students. And that really brings it all together. Can't do it without digital. And you certainly can't do that without an expert teaching force that's willing to roll up its sleeves and learn something new. And if COVID has taught us anything where there may have been reluctance to new in the past, when there's an imperative, when you've made it clear to people what the challenge is and what the options to solve are, um, we've seen teachers radically transform practice, again, out of local materials that they were comfortable with while leveraging new distance tools that they had not had a, uh, a wide scale experience with prior um, to uh, closure. Let me turn to you, Tim. Uh, you know some of the inside baseball, if you will, of the technical requirements that go on between partners to get a project of this scale done. So from your perspective on the technical side, what does it require to get a project of this size done working with a variety of supplier partners? You know, I, I think there's different pieces here, Monica. The number one is, is obviously leadership helps to drive the technical part of this perspective. Without strong leadership and without strong direction, you can have the best technical pieces in the world. And luckily, Chicago right now has great leadership that has great vision. So to add to that, that leadership drives the technical piece of this whole plan is what Marty and this team have created is a, a ecosystem that is designed to go on beyond maybe even their time at Chicago. And so from a perspective, you have to have all the vendors working together. And some of these vendors are competitors. Number two, you have to follow standards. IMS is critical and this would only be successful with standards like rostering and standards like thin CC not only from Chicago's perspective, but their arrangement with the vendors is they're building things in an environment those vendors might want to use somewhere else. And since they're standards-based and standards-made, uh, standards it not only facilitates a good environment for Chicago to say, you know, to support some of Geo's comments about uh, building things that teachers can change, but it takes the vendors into a model that they're building something that they might use beyond Chicago. Um, so the technical aspects of 
the ecosystem here of one roster, thin, thin CCC, the caliber data we're talking about, the vendors all building around this and establishing this credential uh, model so that we can do badging in the future, we can do student portfolios, you know, are all part of that. As, as you know, in this industry, it's easy to do one or two things and promote it that look at what we did, but it's not easy to develop an ecosystem that's designed for students and teachers that still get the administrative staff what they want for data, the principles and the whole bit. And Chicago has spent the time to do that. So technically, you know, I'm answering it with a non-technical part of the perspective, but the technical part of perspective never works unless you have leadership that sticks to a plan and a process. And so, you know, number one, Chicago was ready for change. Number two, the leadership is sticking to the direction. Number two, there's always the uh, the never gonna work type attitude from certain personnel and certain people. Chicago's working through that. And I think using standards across all the vendors and creating this ecosystem that follows that is driving this to a model that will work. And part of that to add to it is, uh, you know, the things that Kara and Marty and Gio are doing is they're facilitating design based on standards. So anything they build within this ecosystem is not what I would call, you know, Monica, you know this better than anyone, a secret sauce, right? When a vendor or a partner says we got secret sauce, I get chest pains because it only will work for a period of time. Chicago is building a system based on quality of educational material built to standards, making the vendors file those standards, institute those vendors and deliver that to the district. Kara, let me um, go back to you. Why is CPS choosing to release the content early? Well, that's a great question. So the, the logical assumption would be, which is not untrue at all, that um, COVID-19 related school closures were a big influence and they absolutely were. But the truth is there, there, was, a, there was a plan to release content to schools from the beginning as soon as it was created, even with the understanding that, that, that what we would be releasing was not a fully coherent curriculum. And the reason for that is the role of teachers, of CPS teachers in the development of the curriculum. So although we contracted with vendor partners to create content for us or adapt existing content, the, um, the teacher voice has been like elemental from the beginning of the process, even from the beginning, even like pre-beginning when we were selecting um, vendor partners to develop curricular content, which teachers were on the committees to make those selections. Um, so then part of the work of this project is like iterative cycles of improvement. And because of the extremely speedy timeline that we've been building all this out, there was never an expectation that what we released to schools would be like perfect, like the final word without any need for changes, adjustments, alterations. So in, the, in that spirit, we are releasing content this August and in the hopes that um, teachers will provide feedback on the materials that they are reviewing, that they are selecting, that they are potentially teaching or supplementing existing content with, and that we can integrate that feedback into um, theoretically into cycles of improvement to try to improve the existing content before the, the official launch. In addition, um, as at each cycle of development, vendor partners have created curricular content. It's been delivered to CPS for review and all that review is done by our teachers, by large teams of, of almost 400 teachers and a handful of folks from um, our, our colleagues at Central Office. So, um, there are there's so many different factors that have played into this and we definitely are rushing toward um uh not just a feedback release but a release that also we want to en encompass student learning and supplement and provide materials to teachers wherever possible in a remote learning scenario but we are just hoping to integrate that teacher voice as much as possible into the final delivery which will still allow for teacher adaptation and modification, but that gives us a year to take all of what we've learned into consideration for the final release. 
So Giovanni, uh, Kara mentions cycles of improvement. Um, what advice would you give a district embarking on a similar project um, with, let's say, maybe um, more limited resources? Sure. You know, um, in in the in the research that went into um, designing this project, the build it yourself path became very obvious was not a viable one. Um, takes a very, very long time. Um, obviously, off the shelf curriculum material we found wanting in the fact that the typical student that those materials are written for are not the typical student that we have in Chicago public schools. So we needed modification uh, to meet our use case, uh, to, to serve the needs of our particular students. Um, the flip side of it, this hybrid model, I think is the way to go because one way you can consider this project is you know, the, the curriculum is coherent and tied to standards um, and is digi uh, digitally delivered. But if you do not allow for um, modification and remix, you're missing a lot of energy that your teaching staff has. So as you can imagine, teachers can be a little opinionated. And when we share our, our curriculum uh, in the production cycles with our teacher reviewers, they have a lot to say about it. And not everything that they have to say can be directly and immediately acted upon by the vendor partners. Our ability to memorialize that teacher feedback gives us multiple tracks of development. So we're currently in the process with our um, vendor partners and they're iterating the curriculum. At some point, some things that teachers are asking for that cannot be immediately acted upon need to be roadmapped for future development. And those are things that we imagine our central office curriculum designers will be able to address over time. And then the third piece is the one that I'm most excited about and that's when teachers begin doing modifications. I really look forward to the very first time we've got the curriculum out and a teacher remixes a playlist perhaps working with a special ed teacher as a co-teacher, or perhaps working with a teacher that provides language supports. And they create a couple of modifications to a lesson and then say to the district, hey, take a look at this. We think this is um, even better. And then we get a chance to look at it and we see that it's better. And then we reshare that remix out to the district. Because that's the point in time where everything sort of converges uh, on, on what we've been planning for. You get the ability to get the benefits of what most people are after when they try to build it themselves, that it's very focused on their local needs, but we also get the benefit of getting the curriculum out to the teachers on a reasonable timeline by leveraging partnerships with large uh, curriculum vendors. And when all of that converges and you really start to see the activity, in that sense, the curriculum becomes a spark. Um, and it's the sparking aspect of giving people, again, a guaranteed viable baseline from which to innovate from. At that point when we start, that's even more powerful than teachers just providing feedback to us. They're actually lending, um, they're lending effort and design at that point. And as these wheels begin to turn more quickly and your professional development is sparking teachers to think about their practice in different ways. And then because they're thinking about their practice, they start innovating with the materials in different ways. And then they begin sharing those out. You start to get a lot of energy, a lot of activity and a curriculum that's truly a living curriculum, something that iterates on a reasonable time frame. So with my last question, I'll, um, I'm going to start with Marty, but I open this to all of the panelists. What can we look forward to seeing in the fall of 2020 with regards to the Curriculum Equity Initiative? Wow. Well, I think, um, you know, what I'm looking forward to is just to, is, is to roll out the adoption by teachers. I think this, um, this COVID scare that we've had uh, has really... Uh, 
really brought out some some superstars in the district um, uh, that have um, started doing remote learning and and have found that it's not as, as scary as they may have thought. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to, as Gio just mentioned, having teachers take that curriculum, maybe modify it to better fit their needs. Uh, I'm looking forward to third party integrations of, of, of different ed tech um, initiatives that we have going on around the district. Um, spotty around a district now being dragged into this and uh, being more effective, more impactful. Um, third party groups, uh, museums, zoos, aquariums, to be able to bridge subject matter experts directly into the classroom. Uh, I think that's gonna be big for the fall. Uh, so those are, those are just some of the things I'm looking forward to. Great, anyone else care to add? Well, I'm a little bit biased. I have four children in the system, <laughs> so I'm actually looking forward to seeing these materials <laughs> in their hands. Um, I've, I've had the cell phone pictures of the teacher's math book shared through Google Classroom for which it needed to be printed and then filled out and then scanned and then sent back to the teacher. So uh, certainly, um, I'm, I'm definitely excited about what these opportunities are actually going to be bringing to my actual children. So I'm, I'm definitely excited to see uh, how it looks in their hands. Great. I think we're all very excited to see that. So thank you. Thank you to our panelists uh, for being leaders and innovators regarding this very important dialogue. Um, we've been thrilled to have you join us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.